Wow, what another awesome episode. This one is with Nick Honoshevsky. We talk all about his brand new fishing show and really talk about targeting stripers, big old striped bass up in New Jersey. Check this episode out. Pow! Hello, Salt Strong, Fish Strong Nation. It's Joe Simons. And Luke Simons. We are back. We got Luke back on the podcast. He was out all of last week, and yep. uh, this is going to be a cool one. And before we get started, we got to give a little shout out to our sponsor, which is the Salt Strong Insider Fishing Club, the only fishing club that gives you new spots, new trends, new tips every single week, the stuff you can't find out there anywhere else with a 100% money back guarantee if you don't catch more fish in less time. To learn more, Go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. And what an awesome parlay, Luke, about the Insider Fishing Club. The club actually started in Florida. And so it was literally us giving all of our best spots and just calling all of our best tips and, and, and trends in Florida. And then it kind of started growing in the, in the Gulf, like Texas, Louisiana, Alabama. We started getting a lot of members there. And then it kind of started going up the coast. And now, like, yeah. South Carolina, North Carolina is blowing up. And even further north now, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And so a lot of people have been asking about, you know, surf casting and they're talking about stripers. And it's like, it's kind of out of our realm a little bit. So we're like, all right, we got to get some experts that really know that area, in particular, like upwards of North Carolina up in the New, New Jersey, New York area. And we met this guy, Nick, Nick Hodoshevsky. Uh, talk about just a fun dude. We met you at ICAST many years ago, and we continue to go have beers with you every time we're there. And uh, just a joy to be around. Super smart guy. And from the looks of it, we're going to talk about his show, Saltwater Underground. Looks like a really fun guy to fish with. Uh, so, Nick, dude, welcome, brother. What's up, boys? How you doing over there, Joe and Luke? Good to hear your yeah, voice, man. Good. <laughs> the striper yeah, expert. Man, Right, yeah, you sound good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah so we, we just watched your show, uh, Saltwater Underground, on Tackle Direct there. And uh, I watched the Striper one first. I'm going to watch the Fluke one next. But it was awesome, man. But before we get into Thank all that, you. before we get into all that, take us back. Like, how did you get into fishing? Did you grow up fishing? Where, where did where did you grow up? What was the childhood like, et cetera? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, luckily I had a, a you know a family that fished uh, – you know, my father and my brother and my mom all fished and hunted. And uh, I guess saltwater angling, um, you know, I, first of all, I live up here in New Jersey along the Jersey coastline uh, in Lavalette right now. And there's a there's a huge uh, state park called Island Beach State Park. It's about 15 miles long of a protected barrier island. And uh, that's kind of like a rite of passage for everyone in Jersey who fishes. Is like, you know, you start surf casting at Island Beach for stripers, blues, and all that. And uh, when I was got about like five or six years old uh you know it's about an hour drive from anywhere in jersey you know uh, like you, you know jersey you can get anywhere in an hour so uh we uh my dad used to take us down there and we catch stripers for the first time um you know just tossing out clam rods and ava jigs and stuff and pulling on like 26 28 inch bass and that's kind of what got me hooked to the whole saltwater thing uh when i was young and uh, I was lucky enough to have a, you know, dad that took me out and took me fishing. So, and it just kind of blossomed into that, I guess. Now I make a career out of the fishing industry. So obviously I had an impact on me. That's awesome. Well, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause that's a question we get so often, obviously fishing tips, everyone wants to know, but there's so many people that want to do what you did. And so tell us like, how, how did that evolve? <laughs> Meaning like, how did all of a sudden you figure out a way to make a living at this? Well, in this industry, if you want to do it full time, be prepared to be very, very poor for a long time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, uh, you know, if, if it's your passion and you don't have anyone else, that, like, luckily, well, not luckily, but, um, you know, I'm not married or have children right now. So I've been able to uh, cruise around the world and fish all the time. And uh, I didn't have those pressing obligations that people normally do. I put in my time instead. And now it's blossomed. Uh, you know, I started out when I was... Uh, <laughs> I guess I was 23. Uh, I went to Villanova University, got a degree in like marketing and had all my boys, you know, offer me jobs on Wall Street as like a trader, like, you know, working for ad agencies. I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to be sitting at a desk my whole life. I'm an outdoor guy. 
So uh, I walked into uh, the Fisherman Magazine, which is a North, uh, like an East Coast publication, and uh, started working there, uh, sweeping up floors, and then I became circulation manager, then ad sales guy at a fishing mag, which was cool. And then uh, after that, I left them in 2002 and went uh, full time freelance. And and uh, you know, basically right now I write for all the magazines. Um, I was editor at saltwater sportsman magazine uh from 2010 to 2012 and that was really cool that's when i was a florida boy man i was living down your way yeah. uh there in winter park where all the magazines are based out of now but um yeah so and then i left them in 2012 to move back to jersey because i kind of even though i loved working for saltwater sportsman i'm still the field editor over there i just loved uh having my own freedom to fish whenever i wanted to so um <laughs> But it's cool, man. So right now I'm field editor, you know, at Solar Sportsman, uh, editor at Guy Harvey Magazine, field editor on the Water Magazine, The Fisherman, uh, Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, all the magazines, man. So that in a nutshell is what I've been uh, what I've been doing, man, to make a living out of it. So I hope, it, you know, it's it's a lot of grind, man. Is what it is. You know, you got to be expect a lot of failure as a writer, you know, and get rejections a lot. But once you establish yourself after a while, you uh, kind of get into the flow of things, you know. Yeah, and your kudos to you. I've I've watched you just from iCast and how well you just network with everyone and like and genuinely like helping people out, which is what how you you really helped us out that very first time. It was our very first iCast. We were new to the industry, and you're you're like introducing yeah. us to everyone. Like just uh, that's 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 yeah, so that meant critical. A lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and it did mean a lot. It's so there, critical. That's like years of relationships that are built in our industry, yeah. though, too, you know, for anyone who wants to get in on it, um, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know, not to demean anything in any stretch of the imagination, but anyone can have like a YouTube show or, you know, you know, Instagram following or anything, but it's about the relationships you build in our industry. Uh, it's a tight industry, you know, and um, it's built a lot on trust and respect. So if you have that going in, you're already in the door, you know? Yep. And, um, you know, that's kind of what it is. And you got to obviously have a passion for it. Otherwise, getting into some other business, man, where it actually pays. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So let's talk about stripers, dude. You, you know, your yeah, show, you were on the boat, but I know there's plenty of people that catch ton of stripers from shore and piers and jetties. So, like, what what's going on, like, this time of year? You, you, you told us earlier that, is it May and June is, is still awesome time? Well, the deal is, is uh, uh, to, for your uh, listeners, um, the show that I host is Saltwater Underground with Nick Konoshevsky, and it's available on uh, TackleDirect.com. If you go there, you can click on the episodes. And that particular episode we filmed was in the fall for Striped Bass, the one that comes up right away. And um, <clears throat> Striped Bass, for um, I guess for any of your listeners who don't know, they're a migratory fish. They have a spring run and a fall run. And right now those fish are kind of staying in – they want to stay in, in the waters that are like 58 to 60 degrees. That's like the perfect water temp for them. And right now, the water is like off of Virginia and uh, Chesapeake Bay. And in the springtime, they start their spawn. And they're following the Menhaden schools. You guys call them pogies there. Uh, but we call them bunker up here, moss bunker. Um, and those, those bass are, are, are spawning out in the spring in March, April, and May up into, uh, you know, Chesapeake Bay the Delaware River and the Hudson River, the three main spawning grounds. Those fish come up along our coastline in Jersey, uh, usually around mid-April is when we first start seeing them. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, by mid-May, the run is usually on in full force by us. And that's when we catch, uh, you know, that's when, when we catch them on their way up the coast. We got all the bait and all the water. And by mid to late June, they're moved up off of like Long Island, Montauk, and they summer over where that, that same type of water temperature is up in, like, Rhode Island, Massachusetts area. And then during the fall, usually around September, they start making their way back down the coast again. And we'll see them here in Jersey, usually in November and December is when uh, we get them back on the, on, the, on, the, on the way back down. But it's a migratory thing with bass is what it is. And uh, we're getting all amped up right now for the spring run here. Yeah, that's awesome, and I was I was intrigued too with your with in that in that show with just just the technique you guys were using, where yeah. you literally were just I, I've seen people you know so I, I've personally done it where you basically snag your bait, but every time right. I've done it, I'm always like snag it, reel up as fast as I can, put it on a different hook, and then right. drop it down. It was cool that yeah. you just snagged it and just left it there, and and uh, 
yeah. in hindsight, that's so smart. I never even considered <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, we're using those, uh, they call it, you know, bunker snags. And that technique is called snag and drop. And the bunker that we have up here are like a foot long, you know. So when you see these schools, you cast out that weighted treble snag. It's usually like a size 10 treble snag. And you rip it through the school, snag the bunker, and then put it in free spool. But to be quite honest with you, you can do that. Or like you said, you reel it in and switch the bait over to like a circle hook, yep. um, you know, a live line and type rod so you can free spool it back a little bit better. But, you know, if, if when these bass are taking that, that bunker on the treble hook, you want to set the hook like immediately because they're inhaling that thing right off the bat. And as soon as you feel them bump it, you set the hook and, and, uh, and plant it in their, in their jaws. And uh, that treble hook always, most every time will stay in their jaw, but it's, you don't want to let them eat it too much. Otherwise they're going to get gut hooked with that treble. So yeah. if, if, you know, if you're not used to using a treble hook snag like that and setting the hook quick, then reel in the bait real quick and just put it on a, like a 10 O circle hook and put it right back out there. And uh, the bass will hit that same way, you know? Cool. Yeah, and those, that bait was way bigger too than the stuff we got in Florida on the Atlantic coast. We used to, uh, yeah, again, we, I guess we, we never called a bunker, but it's the same thing, but ours were way smaller than that. Yeah, so those are massive. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yep. Now we get, we get them big up here. <laughs> I love I love the f- I love the fact when you did actually reel it in that you literally couldn't have hooked that thing any better, and, and it, you snagged it, of course. But it was it was perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I did that. On, yep, my dad, I did that on purpose. That's <laughs> yeah. Now, that. that's what, you know, you snag them anywhere, and the whole thing is, is when that thing gets snagged, it flails underneath the school, and uh, a big uh, you know the way that. Those striped bass, especially the bigger ones, their mentality is that they're lazy fish, and they're hanging around down underneath the school. Whereas, like the teen class fish, like 10, 15 pounders, are up top, like chasing these, uh, you know, the bunker around. The big fat cows, like 30, 40, 50 pounds, are underneath that school, and they're just waiting. They're following underneath the school for like the shreds to come down from like the bluefish and the smaller bass hitting all the bunker up top. They start filtering down underneath the school, and those big bass are waiting underneath to gobble up those those drifters that fall underneath the school. So that's why the snag rig works so well too. Cool. And that's so, cool. so how how far out were you there, and like what was the depth? Um, <clears throat> well, where I'm at, uh, you know, out of Manasquan Inlet here in New Jersey, that we were only about maybe a quarter mile off the beach, if that, you know. Okay, got it. Um. And our depth there was probably about 25 foot, something like that. Cool. So, you, you know, we were just kind of like, uh, you got the thing with the bunker schools is you can, they, they tend to hug the coastline, but, you know, you can follow them out legally till three miles. That's the federal limit for striped bass fishing. You can't go past three miles. But all those bunker schools are hugging the coast as they get a, they go up the coastline and they just get walloped by all those bass. And the cool thing, too, is that all the surf guys, like surf casters, you can reach those bunker schools from the surf many times. So you can throw that snag hook out from the beach with like a 12, 12 foot rod, like a 10,000, 14,000 class reel, enough line on it with that snag out. And you can snag from the beach and be in the like 40, 50 pound bass from the sands, which is, uh, That's which is awesome. You know? Yep. Yeah. I was just about to ask about beach fishing. So is, is that the, the typical technique or I, I assume a lot of people use a lot of plugs and jigs. Like what's, um, what's oh, kind of yeah. the, the most popular? Uh, for you know, from the surf you're talking, or yeah, 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 from the surf. Well, let, let me put it this way, man. Like, it's funny when I moved to Florida. Like, nobody really. I mean, your surf fishing down in Florida is like you know Pompano, or you know, I'm talking strictly surf. I'm not really. I'm not talking about like bay fishing or anything. But like, <clears throat> you know, guys will cast metals for like mackerel and stuff, or catching Pompano. But surf fishing up here is like a way of life, man. It's like. I mean, it, it's diehard, dedicated people that are, like, losing wives and jobs over the pursuit of these bats. And the, <laughs> there's, like, no joke, you know? And uh, and the thing is, is up here, we like, any given morning, afternoon, or night, you know, you can catch, like, you know, 30, 40 fish that are, like, you know, anywhere from 10 to, like, 40 pounds, you know? And so, like, the fishing's even better from the sands many times, you know? But um, what we're tossing depends on the time of year. In the springtime, um, you know, it's kind of like a bait bite that you're kind of you're, you're starting with because they're so heavy on those bunker schools. But, uh, you know, we use, like, fresh clams or bunker chunks at night. But um, generally, like, we'll be tossing poppers, like three-ounce poppers. Um, there's, like, my go-to diehard 
lure is the black bomber plug, like the A salt or the 16A. And um, it mimics like every kind of profile bait fish up here from like mullet to bunker to spearing, you know, like large spearing. And, uh, you know, bomber plugs, uh, Daiwa SP minnows have been really hot recently. Um, you know, you know that's when all the, like, the bait fish are around. But if there's sand eels around, we're using metals like Ava jigs or Williamson jigs. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then we got like, you know, the storm paddle tail shad you could throw out there. That mimics a baby bunker, like to a T. So there's a variety of lures. You basically want to match the hatch, just like, you know, any kind of fishing. You want to match the profile of the bait that's in the water at the, any given time. So it's a variety of lures. You know, it just depends what you're switching up to. But like I said, it's different lures than you guys use down south, you know? Like, no one knows what DOA are up here, you know? Like, uh-huh. no one even has a clue. They are, <laughs> you know, huh. and that's all we're in Florida, you know. Um, <laughs> and up there, are you you having to chuck them a good distance? So is like a, a ten foot rod like the the norm, or is it? Or anybody yeah, well, using? Truth be told, I use a seven and a half foot Saint Croix. Uh, it's a Tide Master. It's rated for eight to seventeen pound, and uh, I use like a five thousand Stratig uh, reel. I usually spool like thirty pound line. And then my leader is like 30 pound line usually, you know, fluorocarbon. And I'll tie like a dropper for the teaser. And then you tie a snap lock on the end and you can just interchange plugs in lures in and out. But you don't, I mean, you don't, you can be overgunned if you want, but you're, you got to remember, you got like a 10, 11 foot rod and you're casting cast after cast. It starts wearing on your shoulders after like two hours, you yeah. know? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't need that you know necessarily when the big girls are around i break out those big sticks you know like the 12 foot rods and fourteen thousand reels and casting three ounce poppers so i'm basically hitting like haiti you know with the cast. <laughs> how so, uh, how big really long. <laughs> how, how big is a big girl to you guys what is that how, how big of a of a striper and anything over 30 pounds is considered pretty, like, Ooh, a yeah. really solid fish, you know? Yeah. Um, that's evolved over the years. Like, the benchmark for bass, you know, like, when everyone has, like, their, their benchmarks for certain species, like, 50 pounds is, like, the be- the lifetime fish, you know what I mean? I've only caught one 50-pound bass in my life. I've caught maybe, I don't know, maybe I would say, like, 10 40-pound plusers, you know? And then 30 is, like, pretty numeral, numerous, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, but the fifties, like that's the benchmark, you know, <laughs> nowadays you see a lot of guys online. Oh, I got my 40, got my 40. Those are fucking like 21 pound bass, you know, and like everyone's posting that they're forties and they're not, you know, they look bigger than they, uh, than they weigh, you know? Yeah, what was the, what was the size of that? The first one you caught in the, in that show? Was that, was that, and was that a 30 or was that, that was less? About like, like 23, 24 pounds. Oh, wow. I can't imagine a 50 pound. That was a big fish. Oh, uh, 50 pound buckles your knees when you see it, man. <laughs> they look like an alligator in the water. Seriously, I mean, like, you like shake. You know, you're like, oh, man, you know. <laughs> That's a you giant. Get, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely uh, gets, gets going right down to your soul, you know. All right, so what's what's your advice for two newbies like Luke and I going up to New Jersey and we're going to go fishing. We got our, we got all the right equipment. What, like... Right. Talking about like spots because I have heard like the people up there like it, it's like it's almost like you know we used to be into surfing like you don't go into someone's territory like these locals they'll they they don't like that kind of stuff it's yeah. like what like <laughs> there's so much misinformation that gets thrown around all right so here let's hear from like, the from the guy who's there dude it gets it gets fucking crazy man like I'm so, I'm sorry if I'm am I allowed to swear on here I know I have an iPod oh yeah yeah no it, not, this will be an explicit one we, we've had we've had a couple of <laughs> right. um yeah it's called spot burning up here uh, do you guys call it that down there no never heard that term but it... yeah so like if anyone like if you see somebody that catches like it's usually these people who haven't been around for a while or they're just trying to make a name for themselves online they catch a fish and they'll take a picture and say it'll show like the lavalette water tower in the back from the surf. Like, like, like you mentioned there, like, you know how when you're surfing and it's like, it becomes like, you become like local with the spots. That's how it is down here too, with the local boys on the beach. It's like, you know, you just burnt the spot. And as soon as that, like, you know, this day and age, when, when something gets clicked and you show something within like an hour, it's blown up. You know what I mean? And you'll have 50 guys there casting right at that water tower like you know casting over you under you and everything like that and it, it, it really gets like uh 
you know, I've seen it come to fisticuffs on beaches, man. Seriously, you know, yeah. it's like you don't want to get in someone's grill. You don't want to burn a spot. <clears throat> and you always want to kind of have respect with, uh, you know, where you're fishing. You want to stay like a good, like, 25 yards away from someone's casting, you know. And there's kind of like a an etiquette about it that people usually know, I guess you could say. But a lot of times they don't. And, uh, you know, it's a... I don't know. It's, I'll tell you what, even my best friends, like, <laughs> here's a perfect story. This fall, I was on a bite in this hole that was so hot. I was pulling like 30 fish out every morning, literally 30 fish in like an hour and a half, two hour time. Every morning, bass after bass after bass. And I was on it myself. I didn't post anything on Facebook, Instagram or anything, but I would just tell my boys, I'm like, dude, another day like this morning. And they're like, man, where are you fishing? Where are you fishing? And these are like my best friends, right? I would tell them like a general area, like it kind of, tell, like, you know, within like a mile or so. I'd be like, oh yeah, man, I was down at O Beach, man. And, you know, and then they'd be hitting O Beach. Like, I didn't see you there this morning, but I saw you were catching shit. And be like, no, nah, no, I was there from like five to like five thirty. I missed you there. It must have been dark. You didn't see me. But like, if you tell your best, this is my theory on that fishing, that type of fishing. If you tell your best friend, okay, your very best friend, he's gonna tell at least one other person, right? If you tell, like, a friend, then he's going to tell four or five people, which in turn opens up that whole floodgate of where it's dozens and dozens of people. And if you put it on Facebook or online or anything, it's, it's all bets are off. You know what Yeah, I mean? game over when that happens. Even if you swear super secrecy to your best friend, he's going to tell <laughs> one more person. I swear, that's how it works, man. How, how, how big is your stretch of, of like, fishable beach, like, is it a, on that one it, spot in particular? It sounds like that was like a actual like a small hole that you just cast into. Well, we get, I mean, Jersey has 120 miles of coastline, you know. So I mean, all up and down is like every stretch is different. But my particular stretch that I fish is from like Minnesquan Inlet to Barnegat Inlet, which is usually which is I'd say about a 25 mile stretch. Okay. But then yeah. you narrow it down to to reality. I'm fishing maybe like hard, <clears throat> excuse me, hardcore fishing maybe like a five mile stretch anywhere in between these five miles and it's that's the thing is like you know you can follow fish and chase reports but you want to be reading the beach and the structure and <laughs> if you know your tides and times of day and moon phases then you know where these fish are going to be at any given time for your best bet you know <laughs> and that's the key to real surf fishing is is knowing the tides and times of day and how they line up with the moons you know so now, I assume you're doing the the rip currents. Is like a, the rip currents are usually the hot spots when they, when they're in effect. In general, the best way to fish for anything in the surf is um, around the high tide mark. You know, uh, two hours before and two hours after the dead high. So the last of the incoming and the beginning of the outgoing. And at dead low tide, you go up to the beach and you'll see where the sloughs are, the cuts in the in the sloughs and the bowls, and where the sandbars are and make a note of that like a mental note where those cuts and sloughs are you know marking them off like say like you're in front of a slough or like a cut and you look back you're like okay there's the house with the red chimney that's right in front of this so when you come up there and the water's high and it all looks the same you just stand in front of that red chimney and you know you're in the hole there you know cool yeah that's perfect yeah, that's the same yeah same exact premise down there that's uh that's awesome i guess that's a universal uh universal technique yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but you know those sloughs. Thing, they're ch every storm or every major like you know blow or nor'easter, they'll shift up, up and down a little bit. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, they're not static. That's for sure. So at, at the end of of the show that we saw the Saltwater Underground show, you guys mm -hmm. killed it. Like everyone who's listening to this, you got to go check out this show. Especially the the beginning was cool just to see your technique. But at the end, I mean, right. you guys, I mean, it was crazy. It was the On top cra water, craziest too. thing I've ever seen. Do you, yeah. do you ever see that at the beach? Like, are you seeing the stripers oh, yeah, like school man. like that? Yeah. Dude, it's, it's crazy. It's uh, like, we got to do this. And, you know, yeah. Like, it, like you just mentioned there in the show, you can see the, the bass are breaking all over. We were about like a mile off then. And they're just crashing on the surface. Like, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, the snook crash, the mullet schools all at once out there. That's what it looks yeah. like. And, you know, we're casting poppers on the fringes and just pulling one bass after another up. But that stuff, man, that happens in the surf, usually in like, you know, ha Halloween on. You know what I mean? Those fish pen all the bait fish inside, 
and it'll, like they'll be blowing up at your feet like that, and you're casting poppers. Like I'm, I shit you not, they'll be bounce, the bass will be bouncing off your legs, like literally, you know. <laughs> and like it's so much that you're like you short circuit, like you don't even know what to do, you know. It's like it's like, it's like you know you're trying to like like underhand cast, you know, like ten feet out just to try and pop one up, you know. It's like you just get so amped. At least I just get so amped up. I don't even like you know what to do, but like you know those those bass when you see them blitzing the surf like that, they'll come up. And it'll be like a 10 minute blitz and then they go down again, you know, and then they might pop up like a half mile down. Then you'll see all the beach bu- buggies driving the beaches. It looks like the Garden State Parkway some morning. <laughs> you know, guys like running like 30 miles an hour on the beach in like a Jeep and like trying to catch up to the, bl- you know, the blitzes and stuff. It, it's wild, man. It really is. There's, there's no better place like I'd rather be than like November in the surf in Jersey. And that, that's a fact, man. I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Every single day is like, you know, action with blues and bass and everything blowing up. That's awesome. Did, did I hear that this, the sloppiest weather is the best too? Uh, would they really charge oh, yeah. them up? Yeah. Oh yeah, man. Anytime you get a blow, like a, like a nor'easter, like, you know, it coincides kind of with everything. When that low pressure drops, those bass really get on the bite and they start feeding and they can feel it coming in like on their lateral lines. But you want to get it like, if you can fish, like the day before the nor'easter comes in, like right when it's starting to get like 15 knots, 20 knots, and the water's still clean and green, but it's mean too. You know, it's got like white caps on it and stuff. That is ultimate striper weather, man. And anytime you get like a nor'east blow like that is ultimate. And then <clears throat> it'll come in for two or three days hard. By that time, it's all chocolate milk by like the second day. And then when you get the west winds, the cleanup winds, the offshore winds, it starts cleaning up again. And when, you know, the winds go west, if there's bunker around, they go, they swim directly into the wind. So the bunker will come up on the beach, and then you got your next shot at the, you know, the next stage of catching bass after that. But you're right, cool. yeah. Sloppy weather is like a, a surf fisherman's uh, friend when it comes to bass. And... Awesome. Yeah, we gotta, we get, we gotta, we gotta do. It. We yeah. talked about it. I cast with you, like, all right, we just. Yeah, every every, every time we see Nick, like we're going, we're going. He gets us so pumped up, and then uh, just life gets getting it's in the way. We need to, we just need to just do it. We need to get up. Sounds uh, cool. I need I need some salt strong guys from Florida to come up here to film an episode with me on Bassin for Saltwater Underground, man. That would be a, an awesome episode. Oh, I would love to cool. see you guys who've never experienced this before to come on up, man. I'm serious. Yeah, man. well, spring. Awesome. I mean, spring we could do it. I don't know if I want to be there with a nor'easter in November personally, but uh, I think that'd be awesome. Well, that would be, it would be a cool experience. <laughs> you guys have like whiskey and stuff like after or even before, perhaps uh, to keep you warm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'm post Russian, so we bring the blackberry brandy on the cold days, you know. What I mean? <laughs> and we're not, we're not exempt from drinking beers on the beach, that's for sure. You know? <laughs> that's the greatest thing too. Is like after the summer, we get our beaches back. So you know, we're obviously a tourist uh, state, so it's uh, you know, from June, July, and August, it's tough. You know, you got to compete with everyone on the beach. Yeah. But then afterwards, man, everyone just leaves you alone again. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> Awesome, man. So tell us what's next with uh, with Saltwater Underground. You got two episodes there. What, what's what's the plan? How often are you film in, and what's it going to look like? Well, we're shooting right now for uh, one episode a month. Um, right now, um, we have Shimano backing us right now, and the first two episodes, we also had Saint Croix and Van Saul, and uh, working on a lot of different guys to uh, you know sponsor the rest of the shows. Our our goal is to film uh, and put up one episode a month. So everybody has something to look forward to once a month, you know? And cool. like I said, these shows are, uh, <clears throat> they're, you know, fun to watch. You can watch them at lunchtime. They're only like 12 minutes long. Every show is anywhere from like 10 to 14 minutes long. So like if you're, you know, at work or whatever, on lunch break, eating at the desk, just plug it in and watch it, man. And, uh, or on your iPhone, sitting on the train or whatever, you can watch it wherever you want. That's the beauty of it is that we don't have to deal with, you know, like times and subscriptions on television. You can watch it 24 seven, man all the time and uh you know that's the goal though is uh film one once a month um all around all around the united states it's not just going to be like jersey based we just did the first two in jersey because uh to keep the cost down for the first two but sure man i'm planning on florida a bunch in florida north carolina california texas louisiana i got a lot of friends we got to get on tv including you guys man heck yeah man <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah for anybody who isn't remotely interested in striper fishing yeah that first one you did is killer oh, even yeah. uh, even if you don't even like try it's just like watching fish being caught that was it was just an awesome episode you guys knocked <laughs> 
ballpark. I, I can't wait to see the uh, the fluke one that, that's coming up next. Yeah, yeah, that, one, that one's pretty raw. That was actually the fluke one was uh, the first one we filmed, and that's the first time I met the production crew and stuff. So we kind of like weren't on the same page of what we wanted. It's definitely a lot more raw and gritty. And uh, I think your, your your listeners will actually like to see that one just as well. It's, every show is going to kind of have a different vibe to it, too. You know, it's like the flick one was more kind of like, you know, reef fishing and with one of my best friends, Sean, and kind of had like, you know, like two bros hanging out fishing and having a good time with it. Boy, you're still learning, too, and drinking beers and all that on it, you know. So it's pretty cool, man. I, I mean, hopefully your listeners will dig them, you know. Awesome, brothers. And it's all on TackleDirect.com, correct? Yep. Uh, yeah, it's on the homepage right now. So if you just type in tackledirect.com, you'll uh, you'll see a, a link right to the episode. It says watch episodes now, and then uh, and then uh, after that, it'll take you right to the Saltwater Underground page. So sweet. Any other uh, places they should follow you or hashtags or whatever social media well, places you're on? Either. You can follow me to the Crabs Claw right now for happy hour because that's where I'm going. After <laughs> but, uh, no. Uh, you can check me out. Uh, Instagram is Nick Honoshevsky, you know, N-I-C-K-H-O-N-A-C-H-E-F-S-K-Y. Uh, I do Instagram, and then uh, I'm going to be launching saltwaterunderground.com in the next month. So uh, cool. eventually come back to that. But, you know, in the meantime, uh, definitely check out the Tackle Direct website and follow me on Instagram. That's what I would say for advice. Awesome, <laughs> ask me any questions, too. Any of your listeners have any questions, PM me on Instagram, man. I'll help everybody and anybody out man with any info they need except for spot burning i don't do that no no spot burning no spot burning. Yeah, no, no spot burning yeah no i'm glad i know what that is <laughs> but that's why i gotta put fake pictures in our background photoshop it <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> Cool. Well, Nick, man, so great to have you on. I can't wait to go fishing with you. And also, I guess we'll see you for sure in, uh, in June as well for uh, for ICAC. Yeah, so. yeah, well, July. Yep, I'll see or you July, I guess, yeah. there. But yep. let's, uh, I don't know, I'll talk to you guys later about getting you up here for bass fishing so Florida guys can see the Flo- you Florida guys coming up and catching some Northeast fish, man. That'd be fun. Yeah, we'll be That'd a killer. Hi, <laughs> brother. We'll okay. be good. Everyone, go check out Saltwater Underground at Tackle Direct, and make sure to go check out all of our podcasts at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast, where you can learn more about the Insider Fishing Club and all the other things that we have going on. That is episode number thirty-three ish. I don't even know plus, where we plus are. Or minus. Plus, or minus. plus or minus, plus or minus, somewhere That's in there. Number with Nick <laughs> Honovsky. All right, guys. Be good. Have a good Thanks, week. Yo, Luke. Thanks. Yep, yep. Whoop, whoop. Peace.